Good morning and welcome to another read aloud of Flush. We've got a mom and a baby kangaroo. We've got a good cup of coffee and a stay at home dog mom mug. Stay at home dog mom mug. Hard to say, say that 10 times fast. We've got Diego just relaxing. Huh? Ready for the story? All right, let's dive into chapter three. Let's see if we can figure out these characters. The one thing I was thinking about last night was the dad who sunk the boat. At least he didn't use anything dangerous, like any bombs or any explosives or anything like that. He just simply pulled the plug and sunk the boat, and he waited until everybody was off. So at least he's thinking about safety. But let's read on. Chapter 3. By the time they let me visit my father again, the Coral Queen had been pumped dry, mopped clean, and refitted with new gambling equipment. I was hoping Dad wouldn't ask about it, but he did. No way, he exclaimed, when I told him that Dusty Muleman was back in action. They must have had 20 guys working on that boat, I said. My father was crushed. I should have taken it out and sunk it in Hawk's Channel, he muttered, or the Gulf Stream. Luckily, we were alone in the interview room. I assumed that my father had convinced the big jolly deputy and probably everyone else in the jail that he was harmless and fairly normal. He was good at that. Mom heard that you might get transferred to Stockdale in Key West, I said. Not anymore, Dad reported in a confident tone. The lieutenant here likes me. I'm teaching him how to play chess. You play chess? my father said. He thinks I do. Hey, how's Abby? All right, I said. Tell her to hang in there. She says you need professional help, Dad. <laughs> Dad sat back and chortled. That's our girl. Did you go see Life's Peaking? I described my visit to the trailer park. My father wasn't surprised that Life's turned down the old truck and wanted money in exchange for providing evidence against Dusty Muleman. Dad, how are we going to pay him when, when we're flat broke? Excellent question, my father said. Let's see if Life's will take my bonefish gift. It's worth 10 or 12 grand at least. Secretly, I'd been hoping that one day Dad would give me that boat. It was an original Hell's Bay with a 60-horse Merc, a really sweet ride. Sometimes, late in the afternoon, my father would take me and Abby out fishing. Even if the snappers weren't biting, we'd stay until sunset, hoping to see the green flash on the horizon. The flash was kind of a legend in the Keys. Some people believed that, and some, some people believed in it, and some didn't. Dad claimed that he actually witnessed it once, on a cruise to Fort Jefferson. For our fishing expeditions, either Abby or I always brought a camera just in case. We had a stack of pretty sunset pictures, but no green flash. You sure you want to give away the skiff, I asked? Ah, uh, why not? It's the best we can do, Dad said. I guess so. I tried not to sound too bummed. Hey, did you meet the famous Shelly? Yeah, she's kind of scary, I said. Well, I said he stole her from Dusty. What did he mean exactly? I figured it was one of those, I'll explain it to you when you're older questions that my dad would brush off, but he didn't. Well, Shelly was Dusty's second or maybe third wife, as for Je after Jasper Jr.'s mother, he said. Then he paused. Actually, maybe they're only engaged to be married. Anyway, one day she got fed up with Dusty and moved in with Lice. I wonder how miserable life with the Muleman's must have been to make Lice peeking look like a prize. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. Dad, <coughs> when are you coming home, I asked. After the trial, he replied. The plan was to use his big day in court to expose Dusty Muleman's illegal colluding. But Mom says you can bail out and come home and still have your trial later, I said. No, I need to stay here and show how totally committed to the, the cause I am. You know how many jails around this world are full of people who spoke up for what they believed in and lost their freedom? Lost everything they had? Look at Nelson Mandela, my father said. He spent 27 years in South African prison. 27 years, Noah. A couple of weeks? That's not going to hurt me. But Mom misses you, I said. That seemed to catch him off guard and take the steam out of his big speech. Dad looked away. It's a sacrifice, I know, he said. I wish it didn't have to be like this. I didn't say anything about Mom and the plaid suitcase because she put it away. The morning I peeked into their bedroom closet and her clothes were still hanging in there. So, so were Dad's. When I stood up to leave, my father perked up slightly. He said, oh, I almost forgot. A reporter from the Island Examiner might drop by the house. It's all right for you to speak with him. Speak with him about what, I asked. My situation. Oh, sure, Dad. His situation, I thought. Sometimes it's like my father lives on his own weird little planet. Let me take a little pause there. Alright. It looks like we're going to continue with Noah here. In July, the days get long and stream together. I try not to look at the calendar because I don't want to think about time passing. August comes way too soon, and that's when school starts in Florida. Man, I'm looking forward to school starting. I'm going to tell you that right now. I miss it. 
Summer mornings are mostly sunny and still, but by mid-afternoon, huge boiling thunderheads start to boil over the Everglades, and the weather can get interesting in a hurry. I've always liked watching the sky drop down like a foamy purple curtain when a summer storm rumbles across Florida Bay. If you're on the ocean side of the island, it can sneak up on you from behind, which happens to a lot of tourists. That's where we were going, Thunder Bay, when a squad rolled through after lunch. Oh, a squall, when a squall rolled through after lunch. Thom, Rado, and I hunkered in the mangroves and held our skateboards overhead to keep the raindrops off our eyes. It took like half an hour for the leading edge of the storm to pass. Then the wind dropped out. The only sound was a soft, sleepy drizzle. We crawled from the tree line and brushed the leaves off our arms. Not surprisingly, the lightning had spooked everyone away from the park except us. Before heading to the water, we scanned the shoreline for pollution warnings. Whenever the biologists from the health department find too much bacteria, they post danger signs up and down Thunder Beach. No swimming, no fishing, no anything. Only a certified moron would dive in when the beach was po when that when the beach was posted with danger signs. I was glad to see that the water was okay, especially when a big loggerhead turtle bobbed up to the surface. The three of us stayed real quiet because we thought the turtle might be coming ashore to lay her eggs. Although usually they wait until dark. Loggerheads have lousy eyesight, so we're pretty sure she didn't notice us sitting there. But she didn't swim any closer. We wouldn't, have bothered, <clears throat> we wouldn't have bothered her if she decided to crawl up and dig a nest. Most of the keys are made of hard coral, and there aren't many soft beaches like you find up the coast at Pampano or Vero. The moma turtles down here don't have lots of options to lay their eggs, so we leave them alone. It's the law to do it as well. After the loggerheads swam off, we jumped in and goofed off around until Tom cut his ankle on a broken beer bottle that was buried in the sand. Rido and I helped him hop back to shore where we tied his dolphin's jersey around foot his foot to cut where we tied his dolphin's jersey around his foot to keep the cut from getting dirty. Rado took him home while I skated alone down the old road back toward Lice Peking's place. Nobody answered the door and I was already down the steps when Shelly appeared from behind the trailer and nearly scared the you know what out of me. She was barefoot and carried a long rusty shovel. What do you want now? she asked. She wore cut-off jeans and a sleeveless top that showed off her barbed wire tattoo and her big arms. Uh, I need to talk to Mr. Peking again, I said. Well, he's not available at the moment. That's okay. I'll come back another time. Shirley noticed me staring at the shovel. She laughed and said, don't worry. It wasn't lice I was putting in a hole. It was last night's dinner. I nodded as if the most normal thing in the world, burying food in your backyard. Lobster shells, she explained. I don't want them stinking up the garbage because they're out of season. Next thing you know, some nosy neighbor calls the grouper troopers, and then, Houston, we've got a problem. Some of the locals in the Keys poach a lobster here and there in the off months. Not even my dad gets upset about that. What do you want to talk to Lice for, Shelley asked. Oh, just some business between him and my father, I said. She was so much taller than me, I had to tilt my head back just to see her expression. She was smiling when she said, important business, huh? Yes, ma'am. Come on inside and have something to drink. No, thanks. I'm soaking wet. So is lice, Shelley grunted, but from the inside out. She jerked open the screen door and followed her into the, and I followed her into the trailer. Lice peeking was stretched out face down on the blue shag carpet, and he wasn't moving. I didn't see any blood, which was a relief, but I couldn't hear him breathing either. Shelley said, Oh don't worry, he's not dead. She gave a sharp kick to his ribs and he started to snore. See, she said, tell me your name again. Uh, I'm Noah Underwood. You're Payne's oldest, right? That's right, I said. Shelly tossed me a coat from the refrigerator and said, Your dad is a curious specimen. Somehow, it sounded like a compliment. I guzzled the soda in about 30 seconds while I edged towards the door. The perfume that Shelly had on was making me dizzy. It smelled like a bag of tangerines. She sat down on a cane stool and motioned me to do the same, but I stayed on my feet. I wasn't sure what was going to happen if Lice Peking woke up, and I wanted to be ready to run. Shelly said, I've known Payne since back when he and Jesse used to be fish charters out of Ted's. He was always a gentleman, your daddy. I mean, your daddy, not Dusty. Yes, ma'am. How come you're acting so skittery, Noah? I couldn't come out and tell her that she was the reason that everything about her, from her face to her feet, was at least twice as big as my mother's. So I said, I'm going to be late for violin practice, which was incredibly lame because I don't even own a violin. Oh, you going to go lay down? laying down right next to the camera. <laughs> <sighs>
which was incredibly which was incredibly lame because I don't even own a violin. Abby takes piano lessons and a portable electronic keyboard that my father bought from a consignment shop in Key Largo. Now, Noah, Shelley said, that's not the truth, is it? No, ma'am. I'm sorry for lying. Please don't grow up to be one of those men who lie for the sport of it, she said, and most men do. That's a fact. As Shelley spoke, she was staring down at life's peaking, and not in, like, an admiring way. That's why the world is so messed up, Noah. That's why history books are full of so much heartache and tragedy. Tragedy. Politicians, dictators, kings, phony baloney creatures, most of them, they're men. And most of them, they lie like rugs, she said. Don't you dare grow up to be like that. At first I thought she was making fun of me, but then I realized she was being serious. Your daddy doesn't drink, does he? She said. That's truly amazing. It was sort of unusual for the Keys. People who didn't know my father automatically assumed that he had to be drunk to do some of the things he did, but he never was. He never touched a drop of alcohol, even on New Year's Eve. It wasn't a religious thing, he just didn't care for the taste, and I think he wanted to set a good example. Why can't I find a guy like that, Shelley said in a small voice. I couldn't help but notice that she was using Lice Peking's head as a footrest. I didn't, it didn't seem to bother him, though. He kept snoring away. You go to public school, right? She said. Then you must know Jasper Jr. Sure, I said. Is that boy still nasty as a pygmy rattler? Oh, nastier, I answered honestly. Shelley shook her head. He's been that way since he was about three foot high. Honestly, I don't see a bright future for that kid. Her mentioning Jasper Jr. reminded me of what my dad said about Shelley and Dusty Muleman, about how she's gotten so fed up with them that she moved out. I decided to find out if she still felt that way. Didn't you used to work on the Coral Queen, I asked? Oh, for almost three years, said Shelley. Was it a fun job? She rolled her eyes. And in bar? Oh, yeah, it was a barrel of laughs. Very glamorous, too. Come on now, what are you driving at? Nothing, I swear. There you go again, Noah, lying. Shelley was sharp when it came to sniffing out fibs, so I just came out and asked her. Did you ever hear about anything crooked going on with that boat? Crooked how, she asked. I don't know, like dumping sewer into the basin of the water? She laughed in a way that sounded hard and bitter. Sweetie, she said, the only sewage I ever saw was the humankind. That's what you call the downside of my job. Oh, this has something to do with your old man, doesn't it? Ask him or about him sinking Dusty's boat. Hmm, maybe. It sounded silly as soon as I said it. Maybe almost always means... Maybe almost always means yes. Okay, let's hear the whole story. Shelly cocked her head and cupped one of her ears, which had, I think, five silver rings on it? Come on, Noah, she said. I'm listening. There was no way I wasn't going to cave in and blab everything. She was a pro at shaking the truth out of guys who were a lot bigger and tougher than I was. But then Life Peking came to the rescue. He stopped snoring flopped over on his back, and he opened one bleary red eye. Shelley thumped him with both heels and said, Get up, you sorry sack of beans, before I, pipe, before I park that slimy aquarium on your head. I didn't wait around to see if she was serious. <laughs> and that's where we end chapter three. So I'm interested to find out more about Shelley. She seems like a tough character, but she seems as a good judge of character, and she seems like she might just want to help for the sake of helping. But we'll find out more tomorrow. We'll see you then.